Welcome to the July 22nd City Council work session. Welcome to everyone at home and here. Uh, the first thing up is, thank you very much, George. Uh, I should thank you while you pan this to me for chairing the last meeting. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, items of interest from the Mayor, City Council, City Manager. I'll start things out by, um, I just want to say, I think all the... Um, Things that have been happening with Create Eugene have been wonderful. And uh, I just was looking at what's coming up. I think it's this week alone is 195 workshops with um, guitar camp, creative clay, weaving, watercolor, oil, yoga, spinning, felt, linen, lace, Zumba, belly dancing, modern dance, ballet, danceability, drawing, photography, and wire twisting. All those things are going on, so kudos to everybody. And then uh, I read in about uh, that the expansion is underway at the service station on 99. And so it will be done by October 1st. They are going to increase their seating there by 75%. They are going to have 125 storage lockers for people, so they'll be able to have a place to, to store their things. They're going to have a new commercial kitchen which is going to allow them to um, uh, uh, use healthier food. And they're going to have a, a uh, actually uh, um, able to um, wash the, the, they'll be able to use um, reusable dishes and cups and glasses because they'll have a machine for washing those. And, um, and that's all because of our CDBG investment. So, very. I think in the midst of a lot of not so good news, that's very good news. And then I wanted to say thank you for Sunday Streets. I don't know what the report was. I guess we'll hear, but all all things I've heard was a, was a great thing. And then coming up on Friday, there will be a grant, an opening of the Willamette Bridge, and then in the afternoon there will be. Um, a ribbon cutting for the new train set. So, uh, two cool things happening. So, those are all things going on um, this week. Okay. Um, Travel Lane County has been the provider of uh, con convention and visitor services for Lane County for many years. And periodically, our contract comes up and they have to uh, submit an RFP, and that process came up at the end of June and um, unfortunately the people at the county are uh, some people were on vacation so the process has been delayed so Travel Lane County has had to get permission for uh, the month of August to operate without a contract uh, evidently this is there were three RFPs submitted so um, we're just waiting to hear back and then also Wednesday evening, uh, my wife and I attended the uh, kickoff of the tour of homes by the Home Builders Association of Lane County. Uh, John was there. Mike was there. Um, John, I don't know, maybe you might want to um, give, a little, um, give a little information as to the, uh, the association between the home builders and the, the veterans organization. I'll let you do that. But it was interesting. I've, I've been attending home builders events uh, about 12, 13 years, 12 years maybe. And the uh, people involved in that organization are getting younger and younger. It's, it's, a, it's good to see that these builders, <laughs> some of them are second generation. But, That's uh, not what's happening, George. <laughs> no, it's not. I, I know it's really part mean. of the equation. <laughs> people that I used to see all the time at these uh, at the home builders events are moving on, we're retiring, and it, it's good to see these young people getting so involved in the community the way they are through this organization. And the Tour of Homes is just their way of showcasing some of their talents. Uh, so it was a pretty good event. And then they had the Tour of Homes going this uh, this past weekend, too. So. Alan? Yeah, um, I got to attend the Eugene Symphony in the Park on uh, Saturday. That was at the Cuthbert. That was fabulous. It was one of those events that was sold out in just a couple of hours. Uh, and uh, it's the fifth one they've done, and I've been all five of them. Uh, and it's just a great great time I uh, recommend it to anybody um, I did have a question about the changes in the in the rules about the food and the no coolers and the one gallon ziplock bag that kind of took 
I surprised, especially since I brought a cooler to have a picnic on the. Uh, so maybe we could get a memo from Renee about that. Um, I also attended some of the Bach Festival in the last couple of weeks. That was really fabulous as well. Um, I missed the last Sustainability Commission because of a work conflict, uh, but we are going to have our retreat soon, which will be to plan the work program and and uh, and incorporate the four three new people onto the onto the group uh, and to the commission. So if you have any items for the Sustainability Commission, let me know. Uh, also, got it's um, activity week for month for the city and. Kurt Corey did a little. Uh, oh, yeah, city manager's activity challenge. Yeah, activity challenge, city manager. And Kurt Corey did a golf tournament, which uh, yeah. uh, I got to play, and that was kind of fun. Um, and that's about it. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as George mentioned, we had the opportunity to attend the Tour of Homes kickoff party, and I was real impressed with that. The work that some of the members of our community do is just real admirable, and it was a wonderful uh, event. Uh, I admire uh, their. The, the spirit with which these folks do some very hard work and under the circumstances um, and remain very positive and do such a great job and uh, an important thing in our community. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to say uh, some of this about the police commission, um, but I think I'm going to let my colleague here because she's looking up some of the detailed information to do a better job of it from our most recent police commission meeting. Uh, I'd also like to announce that uh, the mayor and I will be doing her mayor's one-on-one -on -one in Ward 5 together at, from 5 to 6 p.m. on Tuesday, July 30th at the Market of Choice at the Delta Oaks Shopping Center. So come on by and say hi. Thanks. Yeah, so um, the El Rapa board met today. Uh, no big news out of that. We looked over the strategic goals for the organization for the next couple of years. Um, and we went into executive session to do an executive director um, uh, performance review, but then we had three members missing, so we decided to postpone that for September um, <clears throat> so that we'd have a more robust discussion. Um, and there were compliments given for the partnering with other organizations, uh, particularly the you know creative use of in-kind services and uh, dealing with our respective budget situations and uh, making the best use of resources as they can at the agency. So, but you know things are tight. They're doing more with fewer FTE, with fewer workers, uh, and still trying to deliver their service. Uh, Human Services Commission, on which Greg and I both serve. Um, also, no big news there. There's a strategic business planning that's going on there, and I'm a member of that uh, group, which also has folks from the Human Services Network um, and uh, the Community uh, Advisory uh, Committee, which are all formal parts of the uh, related to the Human Services Commission. So uh, I, I think a lot of good uh, thinking about how we talk about human services and the important work that that agency does and then all the other agencies that it helps to fund. And then on the police commission, um, we just had a changeover in chairs. The, uh, the uh, outgoing chair, Caitlin Lang, um, is moving up to Portland. So she stepped down and she uh, got many kudos at her last meeting for her good work, um, including from the incoming chair, Bob Walker, who uh, com who said when uh, a young woman his granddaughter's age w took over as chair, he was skeptical, but she um, did such a great job. He, she dispelled all of his presumptions about uh, how a young woman would uh, run such a, a group, a diverse group of the police commission. So Bob Walker is our new chair, and I think he'll do a great job. And I believe that uh, he and Tamara um, Miller, who's the vice chair, should be at here at 7.30. So I did hear Councilor Zelinka say he, he didn't necessarily think it was right that the uh, work plan for the police commission is on our consent calendar. So I may ask to pull that off and, and just have opportunity if we want to discuss that at our full meeting. And then up on the police commission's agenda is the chief is uh, 
helping us and, and staff are helping us put together a kind of panel to look at how our law enforcement folks have to deal with um, enforcing laws that uh, have put them in, con in contact with homeless folks on a regular basis and get the perspective of officers in the field on how they go about doing enforcement. Um, and that aligns with what we talked about in our work plan. Great. Thanks, Mayor. Um, just an addendum to uh, Claire's report. Uh, September 16th, we're going to. It looks like we're going to have a, um, a little bit of a retreat with the uh, Human Services Commission. Um, I just talked to Steve Manella today, and so I think that that looks like it's going to be happening at that time uh, to kind of go over some budget issues and other things that are pressing in that area. Um, the second thing is the Human Rights Commission, uh, which I'm a part of, is going to have its um, a retreat uh, this Wednesday and Thursday evening. I'll be attending the Wednesday evening, Thursday evening. I have a, another commitment. I have a group of students that I'm graduating on Thursday. And I think the last thing, um, and probably the most disturbing thing, is that uh, within the last couple of weeks, I have received um, a little over a, a half a dozen um, calls or emails about um, our citizens being uncivil to each other, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, racial and ethnic slurs uh, in our neighborhoods. And uh, I want us to be aware of that because I think that um, for some reason, uh, it's, it's, it, it seems to be increasing. I don't know whether uh, issues on the national front have anything to do with that or not, uh, but um, I've had people who have either come into my office at work or called me on the phone or emailed me about uh, some uh, fairly ugly situations that um, um, they may or may not have reported to the police. So. Um, for a variety of reasons. So I just want uh, us to be cognizant of that and um, understand that there may be some folks under a little bit of stress in our community and not feeling as welcome as they should. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have anything to report. Neither one of my committee assignments met this month. They'll meet to, uh, next month while we're on break. So I'll have something to report. And, and yes, uh, Councillor Evans, uh, it, it is disturbing. Um, race is still a huge, big-time problem in this country. We've made some progress as a group of citizens, but uh, there's, it's not over yet. There's still a long, long way to go, a lot of work to do yet. Um, it, it's still a horrible problem. Thanks. Thank you. Um, first, the League of Oregon Cities is a meeting in Portland. July 26th to 28th and um, the deadline for reduced registration fee is July 31st in case you're interested and I urge everyone to consider it and to go up by train I think we should be supporting Amtrak as alternative transportation and you can go to Portland by train easily um, good I was at the symphony in the park also for the, I've gone every year it was really fantastic and it's a wonderful thing that the symphony does because it gives people who can't afford to go ordinarily a chance to go it it's an incentive to go because it's free and because everybody goes and I think it also encourages people to support other cultural events once you've been to something and you realize it's not something out of your out of your way of out of your lifestyle that's something you can do and it's, it's more likely to encourage uh, participation in all sorts of cultural events. So I think it's a really wonderful thing that is done. Um, I heard a, there have been some burglaries in my neighborhood. That's, this is a negative thing. But one woman who was burglarized said that the police could not have been nicer. She said they were very sensitive and helpful and and it was, even though the burglary was, burglary was a horrible experience, the police were really great and she was full of compliments for the way they handled it and handled her. She was extremely upset, as you can imagine. Um, they stole the love letters and pictures and things that were really had sentimental value as well as things that had 
so it was she needed somebody to treat her with sensitivity um, I went to the Southeast Neighbors board meeting last week a lot of talk about the picnic which is coming up on September 15th and another neighborhood is having a picnic on friendly neighborhood George it's on the it's on the 28th or 28th at Washington Park the southeast is at um, Pugman Park and Crest neighbors are having one sometime soon I forget when but those are, those are all three neighborhoods that I have something to do with um, southeast neighbors are very concerned about the Amazon headwaters as they have been for 15 or 15 years or so or maybe longer than that now and I think it's really time for the city to do something assertive about saving that land it is for many reasons which fit in with our goals and with the goals of the city I think habitat protection water quality uh, there there was an article in the paper recently about the pol what, Amazon Creek being polluted it will be more polluted if we have house more houses and more cars up there it's, it's already in the dangerous situation and social equity because let me stop and try and continue later yeah you want to you want to got more you have to say yeah a little more about Amazon headwaters Go ahead. okay so for social equity it's a place that anyone can get to you can go there by bus or you can go there by foot it's easier than going up to the ridgeline the other ridgeline trail because it's you can go by the running path by bicycle by foot by bus and um, it's also it reduces it will be harmful to the carbon footprint if we have more cars going in that area near near the creek thank you Chris. yeah just quickly um, as you know I'm working on a proposal around a council committee on homelessness and I probably won't be able to get you a draft of anything until sometime during the break part of the reason for that is I'm working with Steve Manella to make sure that this doesn't reinvent the wheel or duplicate work that's already going on uh, right now Lane County is working on a um, a structure for a continuum of care that's required by HUD and uh, there's a whole series of mandates and work plans around that and I want to make sure that we coordinate with that that's not only with Human Services Commission but also with Human Rights Housing Policy Board and a number of other groups and so um, if we're going to create a work plan it needs to jive with the other stuff that's going on so I'm trying to integrate that work in and so I'll get a draft of something to you probably over the break um, also uh, just a reminder the folks that may be listening is we will be having our first all-day budget committee meeting tomorrow um, where we'll begin to take our first stab at how we're going to approach uh, this giant um, issue of, of how we deal with our long-term financial sustainability and stability um, I'm cautiously optimistic I'm looking forward to it um, in a, in a uh, I think as part of our effort to try to to make this a, a well-run and fiscally responsible city last thing I think George um, forgot to mention it is we had our monthly meeting with the auditor um, which uh, is, is going very well I think both George and I are very impressed with how well uh, the auditor is functioning uh, responding and doing things one of the questions we did ask which is something that um, Betty's been talking about is uh, what do we do around getting feedback from uh, actual uh, people that have filed complaints or filed um, with the auditor's office what systems do we use there are systems in place and so we encourage the auditor to get us that information in a more clear and and succinct way so we can have a chance to review that and see that they do indeed collect some of that information have a pretty good response rate so um, those are all the things I have to report Manager. thank you mayor just a couple of items and I'll follow up on uh, George's uh, conversation about the Home Builders Association and the Veterans Housing Project they this year is their annual garage sale they donated all the proceeds to the Veterans Housing Project and presented the check uh, that evening so that was very nice and so there's a kind of a nice partnership there they uh, also have a uh, many of their members I donate time and labor on the homes as well so that's uh, that's kind of fun uh, also met with uh, the Rao Brokaw design team today kind of a little bit of a kickoff uh, they're very excited to uh, get started on the project as we are too and in September there's a work session with the, all of you that they'll come on in and uh, kind of have a, some initial conversations and get some of your thoughts as we move forward but it's exciting to be moving forward on that project so that's fun and then uh, I also uh, attended the excuse me the symphony on Saturday and it really was a really nice uh, event 
And uh, it reminds me that Carm Hagedorn is retiring at the end of August. Of course, she is responsible, among other things, for the Cuthbert. And uh, the team out there does a really nice job in uh, presenting that facility. So, um, Just to follow up on a couple of things, I actually wanted to ask Claire if she would um, send us some information. And I know they've had um, public meetings on the Seneca uh, request from LaRapa for um, changing the rules on that. Yeah, so they're applying for a change in their permit. and. What we were told today or reminded of today is the El Rapa board, uh, if that was per permit was allowed and then appealed, we would then be in a quasi-judicial role uh, in regards to that. So we are asked to take kind of a hands-off approach in terms of the public input on the process. So I'll see if there's any documentation that can be shared, and okay. we'll share it if there is. Great. But they did have a robust hearing. <laughs> That's what I thought. Why would we be in a quasi uh, the El Rapa board. board. Oh, okay. not the oh, city council. <laughs> <laughs> She's on the other We is a different we. <laughs> Which I <Yeah>. serve. <laughs> and um, I did want to say board. to Greg that I think what? one of the benefits of having you on our council is that there are people who will tell you things that they might not tell other people, and that's an important thing for us. So uh, I think we we will we, we will benefit from from your your ear being out there in the in the community and I and I appreciate the fact I mean I, I want everybody to feel comfortable talking to any of us but I I understand that some everybody has their preferences for who they will um, feel, feel safe talking to about things that are um, are bothering them so um, and I think we've been hearing for quite a long time from Chief Kearns and his reports about uh, racial slurs around the community and incidents occurring so it uh, I think we, we all know this is building and what to do about it is we'll look for all of us to think about that because I think it's a really important issue to, for the well-being of our uh, community. And then Betty, on yours, the um, headwaters issue, I know that the appeal from the um, property owners of the headwaters, they won their appeal. So um, that, that sort of changes the game. So you'll have to figure out how you want to approach that with with us if you do. All right, we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the uh, Lane County Community Health Assessment Action Plan. The manager. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to turn over to Renee, who has a team of people here apparently to make a, a presentation for us. Takes a community, right? <laughs> I'm going to be brief as well, just do some introductions. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, partners from Peace Health, Lane, uh, Lane County Public Health, United Way to give us a report on their work um, on the community health assessment Great. and the plan that's come out of that. So was, I would like to start with Dr. Rick Kincaid from Peace Health. He's vice president there. He's also on the Trillium board and on LJ board, Lean Coalition for Healthy Active Youth. Which means he's one of my bosses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan Reese, who has, a who has a very long, impressive title, but I'll say that he's a social worker at Peace Health, <laughs> who's also in charge of community partnerships, um, also in charge of innovation and development and all kinds of other stuff. So uh, we're very happy to have him. And Jennifer Jordan from Lane County Public Health, who is also on the LCHA's board and um, has done a lot of work in this arena uh, for many, many years. Back so. the house tonight or what? Yeah. Claire did not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Uni United Way is also a partner. Chris and Chelsea Clinton is here in the audience, not presenting, but also a key partner in this effort. So I'm just going to turn it over to Rick. Great. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here with the, with the council. Um, this uh, work that you'll see, maybe perhaps some of you have seen portions of it um, prior to this, but this is really the culmination of uh, well over a year of work uh, by a collaborative. And part of the reason that uh, we're all here uh, is because we represent organizations that are um, very invested in the health of Lane County. Um, and uh, as part of that, clearly, um, 
and city of Eugene uh, is uh, the largest uh, population center. Um, and so uh, clearly what happens here has a huge impact uh, across the county as a whole. Um, so what we'd like to do today, um, we have uh, about 30 minutes. We'd like to present, uh, first of all, um, some data. And again, we're going to condense um, probably about a two and a half hour uh, set of slides down into about 30 minutes. So it feels like a fire hose. Uh, it's probably because that's kind of what it is. Uh, but we're going to give you a high level, a look at um, some realities uh, with respect to health in our community. Uh, it won't, uh, many people have left this uh, not feeling very good. Um, we'll try to leave you with some positive notes uh, because uh, what we've noticed uh, throughout uh, our uh, exploration of the data is that we have a tremendous opportunity for improvement. Uh, and with that, uh, we're looking at uh, what that plan for improvement would be. So what you'll hear is what we call a community health needs assessment, uh, followed by our improvement plan. That is our community's plan. And this is a single plan. Uh, and again, because we've created a large collaborative, uh, we feel the only way we can affect the health of the, of the community is to have one plan that we all will have component parts of. And clearly, this board. Uh, uh, and the activities uh, clearly within the city will have a, a portion of this, as you as you will see. So, um, I'm going to present some initial data, and um, so will um, uh, Jennifer. She, I get to normally I have to talk about death, which is delightful. That today I don't. So I'm going to pass that over to our um, public health uh, specialist, and she'll talk uh, about some of the challenges with the diseases that we have, uh, as well as what uh, in fact does kill us. Um, and um, we'll look at um, sort of how we're going to approach that. Dan is going to close with our improvement plan, and we hope that it will stimulate uh, some ideas as perhaps you uh, uh, begin to think about how policy and how decisions within the city begin to intersect with uh, and have impact with respect to the health of our community. Um, and so we're hopeful that this will be a, a stimulating uh, time. Again, we'll present data, and then we'd like some time and, and hear your thoughts, and uh, we'll respond to questions after that. So um, I apologize for the gravelly voice, um, occupational hazard um, dealing with sick people. So unfortunately, one of my delightful patients has passed on a virus, which I'm re slowly recovering from. So oh, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, there we go. Um, so we're going to have a set of slides. Hopefully you have a copy, a hard copy of the slides uh, before you. And so we're going to go through these relatively rapidly. The importance of this first slide is really to designate that we, this is a true collaborative. Um, since the start, Peace Health, uh, as an IRS requirement, has had to um, uh, put together a community health needs assessment and an improvement plan. Uh, the new uh, regulations in the Affordable Care Act have um, uh, uh, asked a nonprofit entities to um, really demonstrate what they're doing in the community, not just what money they write off as charity, but in fact, what, how do you interact with your community? We have to submit a report, in fact, did so at the end of June to the IRS, uh, demonstrating our um, collaborative efforts with the community in addition to um, any charitable contributions. Trillium uh, is part of the CCO. Trillium is the insurer for the Medicaid population here in Lane County. And Trillium has been required because of legislation that actually formed the um, uh, care organization. And so that legislation required that we also participate in this. And Lane County, as you know, has always been invested in public health. And this is part of their uh, process of accreditation. And so we've been able to look at that. United Way has been a partner that we brought alongside as we've moved forward and realized that many of the solutions you'll see are going to require a connection with the business community and with the education community in order to really affect health. Uh, so as we come through, you'll see why we really need the connection with that part of the community. This is not a health care issue. This is really a community issue, and you'll, you'll see what we're talking about. So we do have a common uh, platform, and uh, we all have a little bit different roles. We've had the opportunity to uh, speak with our faith communities, with social service entities. We've talked with our school district leaders. Uh, we've been able to be with our business community in countless uh, um, uh, little um, uh, times with our rotaries and a variety of other community organizations, as well as uh, other governmental agencies to try to get a real understanding around how they looked at health. And so so all of those things were, will come together. We've also looked at uh, an unbelievable amount of data. And so uh, the next uh, slide just simply has a list of a small number of the data sources we looked at. There's actually several pages that would uh, uh, designate uh, literally thousands of uh, pages of data, both for, at a 
national, state, and local level to try to be able to get these numbers for you. We would like to define the community, and again, this is a collaborative effort over Lane County. So uh, with, uh, obviously a, a county that's roughly the size of uh, Rhode Island, or uh, uh, parts of Connecticut, really, but um, it's a, um, a fairly large county, um, but yet only has a, a relatively s a small population for such a, a, such a size of county, approximately 350,000. So as we look at that, um, all four Peace Health facilities are within Lane County here. Uh, we have one facility in Florence and three here uh, in um, the Willamette Valley. Um, and then the county obviously has those same borders. And Trillium is the coordinated care organization for Lane County. So we all have the same borders. So. Yeah, hopefully I can move this. As we looked at the population, again, this is why we're here today. As you see our population slide, guess where everybody lives? Um, and um, the importance of health policy and decisions around healthy lifestyle and living is going to be critical uh, to get the partnership of the leadership within uh, Eugene. Um, and again, uh, this is a, a community that does have a fairly large rural component, but each of these communities are fairly small. So I'm going to just walk through a little bit of the, some of the uh, social economic. And again, um, if you look at data related to education, poverty, what things we wanted to point out were the fact that um, in, uh, we do have a relatively uh, large density within Eugene of um, people who have gone through uh, education and actually have bachelor degrees, whereas you look at a population such as Cottage Grove uh, in, in Eugene, it's approximately 40 percent. If you look at Cottage Grove, it's about 12 percent. So that creates a different dynamic within their workforce and their community, but yet our, uh, poverty rates, which are really, we're, we're using um, uh, the federal poverty level um, as a designation, are relatively the same. And so uh, we have challenges on both sides. We have a population, and many people speak to that, uh, a significant variation. We have a lot of people with quite a bit of education and yet have significant economic challenges. So we thought this was a helpful way to look at our community um, from uh, that standpoint. When we look at uh, access issues, um, we wanted to point out the fact that um, many people do not have insurance. Now, insurance, as you all know, is not necessarily a sign of access. And many people can have very good insurance and have no access. Uh, so, But yet it is a measure of the at least the ability to try to access, whether they can actually do that or not. And we have roughly the same amount of uninsured as the rest of the state. Uh, now, this will change as of January 1. As you know, the Affordable Care Act is also brought on the expansion of Medicaid. And currently, we have 61,000 uh, Medicaid recipients in Lane County. We believe that there is a potential for 24 to 26,000 additional Medicaid recipients that will become eligible as of January 1. So half again as many on the Medicaid um, uh, in the Medicaid system. And obviously, that's a significant concern for those of us in the healthcare industry. How do we meet that access and, and create access and meet that demand? So it is uh, will be a challenge, uh, but there will be always uninsured. There will be people that fall through the gap, uh, and uh, those uh, those uh, folks are going to need to continue to be addressed. Uh, we have a fair population of um, undocumented um, uh, of folks that uh, don't have access to some of the programs, and so we're going to have to be able to make sure we create uh, good access systems, regardless of whether you have insurance or not. When we looked at the population, uh, again, on Medicaid, part of the reason that we wanted to um, show you this data is because it really uh, describes the economic stress of our county. Uh, when we look at communities such as Junction City, where nearly 40 percent of the current population are on Medicaid. And again, to be on Medicaid, you have to not only be poor, but we now have categorical eligibility. So you have to be poor, you have to be a pregnant woman, you have to be a kid, or you have to have chronic illness that actually puts you in disability. So there's a large number of people, far greater than 40 percent of the population of Junction City, that would actually qualify as of the expansion of Medicaid when we lift those categorical eligibility. So the reality is, is this is only a minor indicator of just the economic stress in our community. And again, as you see this data, you really look at that rural component. Now, within the city of, of Eugene, again, it's the smallest portion uh, on Medicaid, uh, but yet the, of, and the, these are percentages, so it's still a very large number. Um, so it's still a considerable challenge even within our community. 
So I'm going to pass this over to uh, Jennifer. She's going to walk through some of the data around uh, some of the health issues that we have, uh, and hopefully this will give you a little uh, an understanding of uh, some of the challenges that we have ahead of us. Thank you, Rick. So as Renee mentioned, I work for the County Health Department, and you might wonder why we look at death. I mean, obviously we can't help um, the people that are already gone, but we know that we can learn a lot um, from what um, people are dying from, and um, that can help us look to some of the external factors that we might influence um, to improve the health of the community. So our overall goal is to keep people um, healthy and well uh, and living as long of um, lives as they can. And so if we look at the data here, we see that uh, heart disease and cancer are the leading causes of um, death here in Lane County. And um, not too many years ago, um, heart disease uh, exceeded cancer, but we've had a lot of um, medical breakthroughs and um, system improvements that have improved that number, um, but we have not been as successful in bringing down cancer rates. Um, so these are the actual uh, diseases that we're dying from. But if we take a look um, back behind the diseases at um, what are the actual causes of death, um, we learn a lot more. So here we see that far and above, um, tobacco is um, the leading cause of death here in Oregon. And um, we have about 22% of all deaths here in Lane County are due to tobacco use um, still. And we have um, just under 50,000 people still uh, smoking in Lane County, about 20% of our adult population. Um, the second line we see here is diet and activity patterns, and we measure those um, by uh, physical activity and then uh, reports of consumption of fruit and vegetables. Um, and we see that um, we have a lot of deaths um, um, from those problems as well. And what we expect to see over time is that we will continue to chip away at the tobacco problem, and we expect to see um, the diet and activity um, um, deaths increasing. Um, Following tobacco and diet and activity patterns, we have alcohol as a, a leading um, actual cause of death, and then toxic agents, microbial agents, motor vehicle agent, or ve motor vehicle <coughs> accidents, firearms, sexual behavior, and finally illicit use of drugs. Um, in addition to looking what at what people are dying from, we look at the diseases that people are living with. Um, our um, nation for quite some time has shifted from um, disease and death from uh, communicable diseases to largely chronic diseases. So we, uh, many of us um, live for uh, many years, if not decades, with chronic conditions before we die from those conditions. And um, the chart here shows an example of some of the most um, prevalent conditions here in Lane County in blue and then Oregon in red. So you'll see that we have uh, quite a few people living with chronic diseases and um, one of our goals is to reduce these numbers so that people can be um, healthier and um, more productive and reduce health care costs as well. Um, when we look at behavioral risk factors, I mentioned tobacco. So here is uh, just a bit of our tobacco data we have. I mentioned that um, just under 20% of our adult population uh, is smoking, but what might be surprising is we have about 8% of our 8th graders reporting smoking and about 15% of our 11th graders. And uh, what we might not know is that most people that smoke started before um, they were um, of age to smoke. So we have a lot of smoking happening in the 8th and 11th grade population, and those populations continue to smoke um, for a couple of decades, often before quitting. Um, and because young people smoke for many years before they quit, and because um, young uh, women tend to have babies when they're younger, we see um, a high rate of smoking during pregnancy. And um, we were headed in the right direction here in Lane County for quite some time, and then uh, these numbers um, jumped up again around 2003, and we see that we have uh, currently about 17% of pregnant women in Lane County, or uh, birthing women in Lane County, reported that they smoke during their pregnancy compared with about 13 percent at the state. So very concerning um, numbers here. And I will point out as well that this is those that report that they are smoking. When we actually have done uh, urine testing for metabolites of nicotine, the numbers actually double that. Um, so again, it's those that would admit that they in fact smoked during the time that they um, uh, carried the child. And this is uh, from birth uh, records. So at that time, um, not many people are excited to to put a check that they smoke during the pregnancy. So this is about half of what we know uh, is present. 
Um, we looked at uh, diet and activity patterns before. Here is um, some maps um, that I've been looking at for about 10 years, but um, maybe they're new to some of you. So what we have are obesity trends across the nation in 10-year segments. So the first map here on the upper left um, is the data for 1990, and we see Oregon there in the um, kind of second, uh, the mid-level blue. And at that time, we had about 10 to 14 percent of Oregonians um, reporting um, that they were uh, of a height and weight that would be calculated to be obese. And similar to um, uh, Dr. Kincaid's comments about um, smoking during pregnancy, we do know that people tend to overreport their height and underreport their weight. So um, these are believed to be quite optimistic numbers, um, which scares us even more. So if we look to the year 2000, we see Oregon there in the gold color, where we have 20 to 24 percent of Oregonians that are obese. And if you see the dramatic change in colors, there, what we see is in 1990, we didn't have any states that had an obesity rate um, above um, 19%. And then in 2000, we had to add the gold color there. And then and we just had one state um, that had an obesity rate um, below 14%, and that was Colorado. Um, jump forward just uh, another quick 10 years, and we see that the nation um, really looks a, a lot different. So now we have states, um, especially in the south there, that are reporting rates of obesity that exceed 30 percent in the adult population. And here in Oregon, um, we're in the 25 to 29 percent, but we're, we're really on the edge of that. So I expect at the next version of this that we will be in the um, over 30 percent category. And um, while tobacco uh, is, um, the problem is still significant, um, we're having more success in that area where the state's goal in terms of obesity is to decelerate the increase. We don't expect um, that we will reduce um, this rate, but we hope that we can slow the increase. Um, we have some challenges with substance abuse and mental health here in Lane County. Um, the first slide is alcohol deaths per 100,000 with Lane County in blue, Oregon in red, and the nation in green. You can see that our uh, local rate exceeds both the state and national level in um, deaths due to um, alcohol. And um, in terms of suicide, we see similar numbers. So our state rate or our rates here locally are higher than both the state and national rates. And these are deaths related directly to alcohol toxicity. This is not accidents, uh, motor vehicle accidents, really, and uh, drunk driver. This is people who have actually died from ingestion. Um, just very briefly on infectious disease, I, I mentioned before that we've had um, an epidemiological shift really from infectious disease to chronic disease um, over the last 100 years or so, but we do still have some particular challenges with infectious disease. And um, here locally, part of the problem is um, increasing rates of uh, parents who decide to not have their children immunized. So um, the slope of the chart is not what we want to see. So um, this is data for um, children, unimmunized children in children's facilities like preschool, um, kindergarten, first grade in yellow, and then seventh grade in blue. And that we and we see that over time, um, the trend of not deciding not to immunize children is increasing. Um, the way that this is. Um, um, categorized as uh, named as a religious exemption. We know that actually very few of these are religious exemptions. It's more of a philosophical exemption. Um, when we look at the state of Oregon, this is a little bit hard to see, but we don't want to be dark blue and um, there we are in dark blue. And this is even more concerning because we are the worst state in the nation in immunizations, and Lane County is the third worst county in the third worst state for immunizations. And I believe, if I remember right, we're at about 8.7 or so um, percent of our um, parents choosing not to um, um, immunize their children. One of the challenges with this is it really creates um, a lack of what we call herd immunity. So if you, the more people that are immunized against a specific disease, the less likely epidemic can occur. And so we are at the portions we're well above uh, the percentage we want to be in order to make sure that we have uh, 
quote unquote herd immunity. So uh, areas, uh, we've already seen whooping cough epidemics uh, significant in the state of Washington. We've seen an inc a dramatic increase actually just in the last two weeks of whooping cough. Um, and so again, um, those are the types of things without immunization uh, can become epidemics. And so that's the reason that this is important. And one of the challenges with this is we've done such a good job of eliminating these diseases that people have forgotten what it looks like. So polio is almost eradicated worldwide. We haven't seen a lot of whooping cough. Um, I haven't seen it um, in person, but I've just watched videos. And it's really, really terrible to you know, watch a very small baby um, just gasping and gasping and gasping for breath and pretty serious issues um, for our community here. Um, moving forward, so we um, have tried to be upbeat about some of it. Um, in addition to the points on the slide here, um, one thing that I might say is that we actually know what to do about these problems. These are largely are not scientific problems. They're largely political challenges, um, frankly, especially in terms of tobacco prevention. We know exactly what to do there. Um, and um, just going to the points on the slide, 69% um, of Oregonians um, report that they want to quit. Um, here in Lane County, 47% tried in the last year. 78% um, of obese adults report that they're, um, they would like to lose weight. And um, Oregonians report taking action in their communities to create um, healthier options. Um, so we you know, have the desire here. And from the public health side, what we want to do is make it easier for people to succeed in quitting or losing the weight or not gaining it in the first place. And on the tobacco side, we would certainly prefer that children don't start sm smoking in the first place. But it can be challenging to be healthy when um, the reality is fast food is cheaper and more accessible than fresh produce. Many of our neighborhoods lack safe sidewalks and parks. We're exposed to smoke in our home, at work, or in the community. And our schools and workplaces um, often lack um, access to healthy food options. So I'm going to wrap up with the data there and pass this over to Dan to share some of our um, key improvement priorities that we've identified um, based on this extensive review of the data. So before we uh, turn our attention to the um, to the positive side of uh, addressing some of these um, uh, areas of concern, uh, which hopefully will be a call to action on the part of our community. Uh, it's important, I think, to take a few moments to recognize and applaud, frankly, the leadership that the City of Eugene has already played um, over the years in promoting community health. And there's a laundry list, actually, of things that the City has done. And well, I think clearly need to continue doing. Uh, but an example of that, I, I believe that the city of Eugene was a, uh, in the forefront of creating bans on uh, smoking in restaurants and bars, uh, if not the first, one of the first in the state to do that. Uh, there's a long track record of the city promoting healthy lifestyles. Uh, the most recent example, I had the opportunity and the pleasure to participate in just yesterday with the Sunday Streets program. Um, so I think we need to again not think that we're starting from scratch here and we need to recognize those uh, good works and to really learn from that and build upon it. Um, as Rick had mentioned there's a myriad of issues we didn't touch on all the issues that emerged uh, in our assessment that was not just based on um, you know data but also in talking to the community and talking to folks from all different spheres of the community about the things that were affecting their health um, and what we needed to do is realize that if you're going to really have an impact, you really do, a community needs to focus. And that we're striving for is, a, is something that you might have heard of before, but community impact, collective impact on these issues. So we can't boil the ocean. So we have to really um, go through a process of discerning what are those areas of opportunity. There's an area of need, and you've heard several of those. Uh, we have to also know where there's evidence that we can make a difference, uh, that they're not insurmountable problems. Uh, we, have, we can be hopeful that we can change these things. We have to look at where there's readiness in the community to get organized around these issues. And also we need to look at what else is going on in the community that affects health that maybe some other folks are already starting to organize around and rally around. Public safety is an issue, uh, economic issues, uh, child abuse emerged as one of the key areas of concern, by the way, that we didn't touch on here. But we know that there's going to need to be um, sort of a, a, a solid line between some of the, this work and other work that's 
really important work that's already been launched in the community. Uh, so what we arrived at is a, a limited set of improvement objectives that you see here. So the five areas that we thought needed focused um, work, and we had a, a real opportunity to improve, <clears throat> was health equity. And we can go into a little bit of detail about what that really means, but it means that all populations, all communities within the community have equal access uh, to improvement in, um, in their health. Um, and currently we know that's not the case. Um, we need to uh, prevent and reduce tobacco use. We need to prevent and reduce obesity. We need to improve mental health and reduce substance abuse. And finally, we need to make sure that we have adequate access. And uh, Rick talked about this a moment ago. We have a great opportunity with the rollout of the Affordable Care Act and more specifically Cover Oregon uh, Health Insurance Marketplace, as I believe it's deemed now. Uh, but just because you build it, it doesn't mean they will necessarily come. And there's going to be a massive effort in the state in order to enroll folks in their options. And uh, for many folks, there'll be new uh, options of available to them, more affordable options available to them. But um, in many cases, the most vulnerable uh, and challenged uh, residents of Eugene are going to struggle the most to understand what is not, it may have some opportunities, but one thing we know it's not, it's not all that simple. And so a lot of folks are going to need some assistance in, make, in taking advantage of this uh, new um, Affordable Care Act. So uh, we need to organize around that. <clears throat> now, uh, we're going to focus for the next few minutes more on Eugene and what the city may think about and the, th the kinds of things that the city could do. Uh, and we would encourage the discussion uh, in these five focus areas. Uh, we're in the process, and I'll, I'll kind of wrap up of where we're going in, in rallying and engaging the all spheres of the community in these five areas, but uh, we're going to first talk a little bit more ab specifically about uh, what the city of Eugene uh, could take a look at. So in the area of improved health equity, uh, the city could consider how land use, transportation, housing, and other city policy decisions impact health. And I'll just add to this across all areas of the city and all neighborhoods in the city. Because uh, again, um, the degree to which all areas and neighborhoods of the city have access to um, healthy living options may not be the same. We need to use policy to create a community that provides access to healthy options uh, regardless of income or educational and ethnicity. Uh, encourage city staff to participate in relevant community health improvement work groups. Uh, I'll talk about some of those work groups in just a moment. Um, and regularly call on the uh, public health officials uh, for input on related de decision making and policies. We, we, we do have um, some excellent resources. Uh, within Lane County, within the city. Uh, I'm sitting next to several of them right now. Uh, and we would encourage the city to routinely tap into the expertise <clears throat> when you're considering all different kinds of city policies. C consider, just like we look at env environmental impact, to look at health impact of policies. Things on zoning, transportation, for example. Uh, in the area of prevention and reduction of tobacco use, uh, the city could learn more about the impact of tobacco use uh, on the health of the community. I'm sure some of these slides regarding uh, the use of tobacco among pregnant um, women was an eye-opener for some. Um, and, and to understand the economic as well as the health impact of tobacco use. Uh, the city um, council could demonstrate strong support for tobacco control legislation, uh, advocate for local and statewide tobacco control policies such as cigarette tax and the increase in cities' uh, tobacco retail license fees. Um, you know, the, there was uh, uh, several bills in the legislature uh, just recently regarding the uh, state tax. Uh, the city could, could look at what's being proposed and choose to weigh in on those. Uh, encourage other local elected officials to join in related advocacy around tobacco use. Um, because <laughs> now with uh, um, things like uh, the ban on smoking and, um, and bars and restaurants, the impact of that will be greater across political jurisdictions if everybody kind of gets on, on the same page. Uh, consider tobacco-free properties, particularly outdoors. Uh, we've taken a look at, at tobacco-free zones within bars and, and restaurants, but we live and work and play in an, 
in a lot of other places as well. So the degree to which the city could weigh in uh, on opportunities uh, to make those environments more smoke free as well. And then encourage uh, uh, local public and private and nonprofit organizations to similarly adopt tobacco free campus policies. Uh, the University of Oregon, I'm pleased to say Peace Health, have all adopted smoke free environments. And we've actually not only done that, but we've learned a lot from doing that. We learned a lot about what the, some of the headaches can be. Uh, and what some of the keys to success can be and some of the ways to mitigate the challenges of implementing those policies. For example, uh, when you enforce a, a policy to not just take a stick approach, but you know, give people that are in charge of enforcing a smoke-free environment some resources to give to people when they're reminded, I'm sorry, it's not okay to smoke here, but maybe hand them a place where they could go for some help if they did want to quit smoking, like the state uh, quit line, for example. With regard to obesity, uh, the city could um, uh, look for opportunities to champion efforts to both improve nutrition and improve active lifestyle. So, so certainly uh, an important area is to support what is really a troubling decline in the availability of uh, physical e education in our schools uh, to have uh, uh, opportunities to use alternative uh, transportation, bicycling and pedestrian, another area where Eugene has really taken a leadership role, uh, and support public transit, uh, farm to school programs, um, and safe routes to school programs, for example, are great models. Uh, promote and provide for fruits and vegetables in a variety of settings such as farmers markets, farm stands, mobile markets, community gardens, and youth focused gardens. Implement fiscal policies and local ordinances to discourage consumption of calorie dense, nutrition poor foods and beverages. Um, for example, tax policies and incentives, land use policies and zoning around the siting of certain types of food options. Um, we just, not too long ago, one of our uh, schools had a um, uh, fast food establishment open almost across the street. You know, so that, we look at how we site bars uh, and other kinds of uh, business establishments, we may want to look at these kinds of things as well. It can be touchy, political, certainly, controversial, certainly, but I think weighing decisions with a lens of public health um, is very appropriate without being too prescriptive here. Um, with the regard to prevent and um, and reduce obesity also, uh, create he um, healthy food and beverage environment so that it'll, it's easier for people to make healthier choices for themselves. Um, to support the adoption of healthy vending machine policies, um, Rick just championed that effort within Peace Health. Interestingly, we found that the vending industry is starting to, the light bulbs are going off. And uh, I think when they get critical mass to the, and, and realize where the market is going, that the industry will come along with where the market is going regarding our vending machines. So the city can participate in helping move the market uh, to encourage staff to select uh, staff, city employees, uh, to select healthier foods and beverages while serving uh, food at internal and external meetings and events. Um, one thing we didn't touch upon in terms of economic impact, we'll talk about this in just a minute, the city has a huge direct stake in health care costs for its own employees. So the degree to which we can improve our healthy environments for the city, it improves the healthy environments for city employees and can have a positive economic impact on the city as well. Um, to promote, uh, so in the area of promoting mental health and reduced substance abuse, uh, the city can support community organization policies that promote increased awareness of substance abuse and, and mental health and the impact of substance abuse and mental health issues on the community. Encourage uh, mental health friendly workplaces um, ensuring that our workplaces are not toxic uh, and can have an adverse impact on individuals, not only mental health, but along with that, and their, their physical health as well, uh, and to reduce alcohol and other drug abuse, uh, to promote early mental health and substance abuse screening and assessment uh, and referral policy. So that's something that we're particularly um, taking um, a close look at within the healthcare community uh, of providers Trillium has implemented some, um, some plans to uh, further assist in the early screening and referral for treatment uh, for mental health issues and substance abuse. 
With regard to access to care to ensure that, that benefit packages for city employees uh, includes benefits to staff uh, uh, would have to um, uh, uh, encourage the cessation of smoking, uh, Weight Watchers uh, programs, access help with chronic disease self-management programs, and incentives to encourage active commuting. Now, I just heard, I think, from Brene that uh, recently the city has been successful in starting to um, uh, put these kinds of health promotion uh, elements into your um, uh, health benefits package. Is that right? So that, that's the kind of thing that we would certainly want to encourage. And, and the city can serve, again, as a leader and a model for how other uh, businesses in the community might do that as well. And I think it's going to be really important for the city to help make the business case for improved health. Uh, the economic impact of poor health and the opportunity to reduce cost and improve the economic climate of the community through improved health. Uh, Lane County currently ranks 17 out of 33 of Oregon counties for overall health outcomes. The uh, degree to which our public health indicators are positive can be part of how we sell our community to folks who want to come here or establish businesses here. This can be either something uh, that will reflect poorly on the community as a place to come and do business or to move, or it can uh, be a positive for the community. Um, and we also need to, um, uh, again, talk about uh, improved health in terms of the impact on the city budget uh, and the impact on uh, uh, the pressure on taxes and the degree to which these health promotion efforts and and the degree to which we invest, either in the city budget, county budget, and other ways, how we invest in uh, public health improvement can have a, a very real ROI. So the steps for success, where we go from here, we need to continue to the, what has been uh, an extremely um, energizing collaborative effort over the last year. Uh, we've gone out and spoken to, by we, I mean all the folks here speaking to you today, have gone out to, and, and spoken with dozens and dozens of community groups in, in uh, almost every community in Lane County. Universally, what we find is a high level of interest this is what our citizens want us to focus on. They certainly want our health industry to focus on this, but they want all of us to focus on this. This resonates with them. So, uh, so we want to build upon that now because we've highlighted problems. Now we want to energize them uh, to know how they could participate in making a difference, a positive impact. And we know that they can. There's plenty of reason to be hopeful. As Jennifer cited, this, there's a lot tougher problems out there. This, a lot of these are going to be tough. But they're not necessarily all that complicated. There's a difference between being tough and complicated. Uh, and we can do this. <laughs> so, um, so what we're doing right now is organizing the community uh, in a very focused way. And I think it's the last slide in your packet. It gives you sort of a high level of how we um, are um, embarking on this in terms of an implementation plan. Uh, we're very fortunate, and you see here uh, the, this uh, core group of Peace Health, Trillium, United Way, Lane County Public Health um, have been um, really focused on the assessment process, which we'll be doing periodically, actually every three years, and then, and then um, the high-level strategies for the improvement plan. But now it's a matter of a much broader implementation uh, throughout the community, and we're very fortunate that the United Way uh, has been convening for several years now, the 100% and access coalition and uh, a lot of the partners that we need engaged in this work are already around the table in the 100 percent access coalition we need to bring in more people yet we need to link to other united way efforts regarding success success by six and uh, early childhood education and economic well-being as well uh, so we're organizing these work groups the work groups will be in all of the priority focus objective areas that I just described but in addition to that we have have a communication plan work group around engaging the community and, and raising awareness. Uh, we also have a metrics and monitoring evaluation group uh, that's been convened that will look at all of the priority objective areas. So these are, as we speak, being organized. Uh, Chelsea over here from United Way is playing a key role in that. So we're very excited about it. We welcome the participation of the of the city and we welcome you not only as the city council but as individuals if you'd like to participate in this uh, there certainly can be a role for that thank you very much um, George I've got you in the queue okay. um, I just wanted to ask how 
how you've engaged with the city in this thus far? Well, in terms of the city government? Or the, yes, the city government, the city, yes. Well, it, in terms of the residents of Eugene, we've engaged with many I meant groups. But in terms of the city government, I, you know, I don't think there's been a, a lot of direct engagement with the city government per se around this. You know, most of the data, you know, to, to be honest with you, the first nine months of this work it was really um, going out getting qualitative through, com through community conversations and uh, through, through data, uh, really doing the assessment. Most of that data is at the county level. We can drill down to the zip code level, we can drill down to the census tract level, to the school district level on some things, but largely that data is, is amassed at the county level. So I want to say this in a, in a really nicest, nicest way. Um, but I want to say that I think you're coming in and asking us to be part of this. And we do want to be part of this. We think it's very important. And if you really uh, knew that, uh, I mean, we've been engaged in this as part of our Envision Eugene conversation. Um, the state is interested in it. We're, we're, we've been talking about this at many levels. So I personally feel it would have, I wish we had been in, earlier in, involved earlier. And secondly, I think it would be really important for you to hear from our staff all the work that's already underway and how that connects to what you're already trying to do. And I did want to say that even I look on your list, and, and because I happen to be all things transportation these days, um, I, I think it's really important that you get ODOT, uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation, involved in our area in this too, because um, in our lo local um, ACT meetings, when we're talking to all the other communities in Lane County about why they should care about health and the connection of health to transportation, it's a very difficult conversation right now. It's not, it, it, it's not something that you can uh, assume they, they understand. And she's going to be joining us, I think, aren't you? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Yes, she's going to be a, a stakeholder on that group, and that will help a lot. But um, there is a lot of language and a lot of understanding about why that matters in terms of land use and transportation discussion that needs to happen in, in many places. They really, they really don't understand it. We're going to do some work on the act, but, it, but I just want to uh, point to that one. Well, you as well, all of those points are well taken, and I guess I would uh, I would ask um, and invite. Um, actually, maybe John, you could help with this. But uh, if the city has recommendations for particular folks within city staff that are particularly well suited to participate in these work groups, um, that would be wonderful. Uh, we, we do know there's a lot of expertise, a lot of work has been done by the city. Jennifer, I know, has collaborated with several of them and others. Um, but this is the time now we're getting to work plans where we're going to need to actively engage them. Um, so thank you for that. And the only other thing I wanted to mention was that um, I've been very conscious lately through some other works with uh, other organizations that there are places like it, and I think you are working with Bethel in other ways, but. Um, you know, there, the lack of community gardens in certain parts of, of the community, that those kinds of, of things that are part of our job but part of everybody's job to try to uh, bring them to fruition. And um, they're just parts of the community that, that need more focus in other parts of the community for addressing these issues. So one of the, thing, one of the connections we have had is through, through the thriving <laughs> communities work, and we've, we've uh, uh, met with them on several occasions. One of the things we're hoping to do on that very point uh, is to do mapping. Uh, of the community. So. Yeah, and so what we want to do is take that mapping work and, and uh, really look where we need to focus uh, because we do have areas of the community that are underserved in terms of healthy food options and recreational options. Well, one of the things you will find is that uh, I'm sure there's a lot we haven't done, but, I, but we have done some, some extensive mapping in our neighborhoods that will uh, in, in inform you. So. That would be great. And I might actually build on some of um, mm -hmm. Dan's earlier comments about involvement with the city. Um, I think sometimes we forget everything we're doing because we're doing so much, but both Peace Health and Public Health have been involved in the HUD grant, and then also uh, we had a small Achieve grant um, a couple years back, and that work really morphed into this work, and um, Renee um, um, gave us um, Sandy Schaefer from Parks and Recreation, who was, uh, was and continues to be a fantastic partner in that, and we're continuing to work um, 
um, with her and um, with LJ on um, efforts to improve the um, food at the um, parks and recreation sites. And um, I could cite many other instances of um, working with um, I just the think city like staff. You, and, and I say this all the time at the city level, connecting those dots all the time is really a lot of the a lot of the work. And I know that's true with with you and with everybody. So all, all the work we can do to connect those dots to um, reinforce what we're already doing and building on those things seems really uh, important for us to take advantage of. And I would like to really commend the city staff for their openness to this work. I um, haven't met a person who is not curious and does not want to get engaged. Um, so from staff working on, you know, some of the climate and energy work to staff working Thanks. on food waste um, to parks and rec um, and other staff as well. So. All right. Thank you for that. All right. George. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. I've been kind of going through the material, but it's it's quite a study, and I haven't finished it yet. Um, yeah, there's yeah some some ma uh, mapping has been done. We know there's food deserts in e e Eugene. We know what parts of town they're in where it's you know plenty of fast food and plenty of uh, convenience food, but not a lot of healthy foods. We we know about that, and hopefully we'll be able to make something happen and we know that there's certain areas of town where the children's asthma rates are I won't say off the charts but there's a huge anomaly there they're much higher than they should be and that they are in other parts of town I had a, a question on page 11 of the presentation there's a chart there of about um, deaths per 100,000 from alcohol and suicide and I was wondering is that like a a multi-year trend, or is that last year's statistics? Or those are—I believe that's 2011 data. 2011. Calling. Okay. But again, it's a single point in time. Sure. Yeah, but I, I understand. My understanding is this reflect period. Uh, that, that chart doesn't, but uh, we've we've had issues in those two areas. Yeah. Uh, it's, we've stood out in the negative for some time. The, okay. Extremely small font says 2008 here, which um, I'm guessing was the most recent data oh, we had it. available, but it has been um, a trend for some time. I see it now. Yeah, yes. and, we, and the data as we've gone forward has looked about the same. One of the challenge we, we didn't show you, if you'd like the full set, we can give you all of the data. Um, one of the very curious things related to that was really the use of alcohol and substance abuse uh, at 8th grade, 11th grade, at the U of O, uh, and you look at those trends and you can see just an unbelievable rate of substance use uh, in our, uh, in, in young people within, our, within Lane County. And so that is, I think, what uh, stimulate a lot of concern and a lot of effort uh, related to those things. So the incidence of alcohol use in the U of O population is uh, 80%, uh, and um, uh, binge drinking, uh, which oftentimes leads to um, these types of alcohol ingested deaths is very high. Uh, and again, that's again, I know the university is putting a lot of attention and efforts into that, but it's a significant health concern. Yeah, I, look, I, looked, I did look at that subset of data in the, in the material. Um, my, I guess just as a general question, um, I figured if this is a year's, um, you know, year's figures, um, 18% is about 60, approximately 62 deaths in each category. And I'm just wondering, do we know the age grouping? I mean, is it predominantly younger people? Uh, I don't know the specific. Yeah, I don't know the specific dates, uh, ages. We do know that it is in the younger population uh, that tends because um, alcoholism, as it um, in uh, older people, generally doesn't lead to a toxic death because they've typically are chronic users and have developed um, you know fair in, uh, tolerance to alcohol. Okay. So it's almost always in younger people who don't have haven't had ongoing exposure. This is directly due to alcohol abuse, like al severe alcohol alcoholic poisoning. Correct. And and generally, a long term alcoholic will develop other health problems that usually will be listed as the cause of death. But really, the you know the base was probably alcohol abuse. You're right. Okay. So and I know that uh, you know suicide with young people is is a tremendous problem also. So my guess is most of these are young. The average people. age of suicide in uh, in our community is forty six. Oh really. Okay. That's kind of what I was getting at. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So you look at the lost productivity and effect on lives around that. It's oh, pretty significant. Sure. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, I've got uh, Alan, and then Claire, and then Chris. Did I get everybody? Okay. Ready? Alan. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, it is kind of a bit of a fire hose, but uh, it's also kind of disturbing, uh, the facts and figures that you're presenting. It seems like we're getting worse, not better. Um, but then at the end, it was somewhat uplifting in that you uh, talked about ways that we can that we can do things to actually improve health in the community uh, and what I want to get is examples I know the action plan has some specific examples in it but for um, I wanted to kind of pick your brains about what you thought were the best ideas in a couple of different areas about <coughs> examples of the way that the city might do things might do something to promote <coughs> health uh, for instance on on slide 32 um, promote mental health and reduce substance abuse so um, some generic things about what we should do but anybody have any specific things that's, that you'd like to see us do this is kind of your opportunity to say that so th I believe the city's done some work in this area already in um, um, working with um, particular establishments that are identified as troubled areas that were maybe selling um, some of the high octane beverages um, in the large servings. I know there's been um, some conversations with business owners and, and some changes along those lines. But um, one of the things that w that we'd like to see to um, reduce um, abuse by youth is uh, reduce access. So fewer places um, where you could purchase um, alcohol, for example, um, of all kinds. And and um, anything we can do to make it more expensive, youth are particularly sensitive to price. Um, so we could look at um, things there as well. And um, zoning and um, concentration of um, alcohol outlets. And um, one thing that I've looked at um, uh, that's been mapped in other communities is the density of alcohol outlets in particularly lower income areas or areas that are already experiencing disparities. And so what we'll see is not just alcohol, but also tobacco and soda and and other um, food that's particularly um, things that we want to avoid as much as possible really concentrated in areas where we have the highest smoking rates and the highest obesity rates and, um, and the highest poverty rates as well. So really looking at um, some of the, the zoning around all of um, these issues and, and licensing. Well, I think that there's a couple of things. Uh, clearly the um, uh, advertising uh, related to um, uh, both alcohol and tobacco are, are targeted uh, at the younger population uh, and again um, uh, even some of the ability to access uh, those substances in uh, stores is uh, um, uh, variable and uh, we don't necessarily comply always with some of the age regulations related to those things um, uh, so again uh, tightening up uh, those types of restrictions is always helpful and with respect to the advertising again there's you know, obviously limitations with uh, what we can um, uh, regulate or not, but it's clearly that is the focus of the industry. Uh, and again, as you saw the data, um, uh, almost everyone that's going to smoke learns to smoke before they're 19. So it's uh, over 95% of smokers start at that point, and so that's the the focus is really at, at that age group. So things that we can do to affect that, and clearly the cost of a pack of cigarettes is uh, by far the greatest deterrent uh, for that um, and even the cost of uh, alcohol uh, does affect uh, some of those choices and so um, as far as mental health we're um, literally looking at our delivery system to try to begin to address uh, many of the issues related to screening identification early of um, folks that are vulnerable and we're particularly targeting the school age um, uh, groups uh, to look at um, mental health awareness uh, looking at uh, uh, we've uh, focused uh, efforts and Trillium to uh, look at trying uh, to create uh, ways of better decision making early on through a good behavior game which we're instituting in schools uh, in the first grade uh, which helps uh, people with decision making and shows long term that they use less substances including alcohol, tobacco and actually have a higher uh, graduation rate uh, than populations that uh, don't have that one year experience. So we're taking Trillium Medicaid funds and directly funding um, education. So it's those types of creative things to begin to look at mental health, look at awareness, uh, look at how we make decisions. Uh, and that's again why we have to partner with education particularly because many of those decision points um, uh, are, are very significant and uh, how they make choices around substances as well as just how we deal with stress. Uh, and we are in a very stressful environment. We have a large number of children that are exposed to unbelievable levels of uh, 
violence and dysfunction, uh, how do you help try to create a supportive environment so that they don't go down that same pathway and they learn how to make better choices. So that's where the effort is and um, we, we may not be able to uh, target the, sort of the end of that line, but we want to get in front of it. And so that's where m many of our efforts will go. Some of you might, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What, uh, some of you might have had an opportunity to read a guest um, um, opinion piece in the Register Guard probably about a month ago by Tony Biglin from Oregon Research Institute. And I thought he was very articulate in uh, reminding us that the science of, uh, of um, behavior and mental health included in that uh, has really advanced uh, tremendously in recent years and that uh, we do know of strategies that can reduce um, long term the uh, probability that individuals will engage in a variety of different high risk behaviors, be it substance abuse or, or uh, uh, smoking or whatever. So um, he, he summarizes by saying there are some interventions that can cross all of these risk areas, smoking, obesity, alcohol and so forth, drug use, crime criminal be, uh, behavior and it, it's distilled down to those strategies that can create nurturing environments. And um, uh, one Rick just cited, one, uh, but, but there are others that we really need to explore more and see how we could further disseminate across the community to help create nurturing environments where there's lower stress, better decision making and so that the probability that kids will grow to make poor decisions is reduced. So education at an early level really pays off in the long run. Well, as in most prevention efforts, the earlier you can address these issues, the, the, uh, the, the best the return you're going to get. Yeah, we've also looked at things at the city like uh, um, high octane malt liquors and things like that and preventing them, but at a city level we're not allowed to do that because they're at state laws. Same with some of the other things that we've um, tried to look at. Another um, example that I'd like to uh, have you look at or give me is uh, related to um, uh, uh, the obesity. And, and it says you have um, uh, on slide 30 um, examples of taxes, incentive, land use, and zoning regulations. Kind of touched a little bit on that. About uh, Any examples of what other cities have done? So some of what we're seeing in some cities is um, deciding that one particular town or area of town has enough fast food, for example. So I believe it's East LA has said, we have enough fast food here. Um, we will not allow any more fast food restaurants um, to open up in, within this geographical area. Um, and there's also work being done to um, keep um, such establishments, for example, a, a further away from schools, so within you know a thousand feet or um, or further uh, from schools. Um, also, uh, some a couple of cities have done uh, where they required in a couple of states calories on menus, where you actually have that. So we have that coming actually at, at a national level. So. Um, here in um, Lane County, we were having that conversation at the county level a few years ago, and during the midst of that conversation, a statewide law was passed, and then that law was actually preempted um, by legislation in the Affordable Care Act. So the details of that are still being worked out, and I hope we'll see it soon. It's been um, quite a while in the coming, in my opinion, but um, we should see that. So it is included in the Affordable Care Act, and once the details are worked out, we will be able to have calorie information um, for chain restaurants with 20 or more um, chains. What about at the local level for smaller uh, one shop, two shop kind of folks? That is that kind of information that very accessible or easy to create or easy to access? Um, there is actually preemption of work along those lines um, included in um, the Affordable Care Act. So sort of with the discussions around requiring it at chain restaurants, um, at the federal level it's been agreed that there won't be um, additional calorie requirements. So we're, um, when that comes out, we're essentially <coughs> done with that work um, for now unless we can change that legislation to allow for it. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, Claire. Thanks. But you can always ask your local establishment to post that information as a public benefit, even if they're not required to do so. Um, so I just had a few comments, and uh, this will serve as both a uh, disclosure and a shameless plug. So um, I, uh, in my uh, day job, run a nonprofit called Elche, the Lane Coalition for Healthy Active Youth, and we're working 
directly on uh, promoting policies throughout Lane County that would try to get at the childhood obesity epidemic. And so we've been partnering with uh, Lane County Public Health, and we've uh, also par uh, participated in some of the work uh, that went into creating this, this uh, plan and uh, may be coming before this body to encourage policies to be adopted at the city level um, that would get at some of the strategies that are, are being discussed in this uh, outline. Um, and so I just also wanted to highlight a little bit of what the city has done. Uh, so uh, I don't know where, what the status is on this, but the city has applied for a federal grant called the PEP grant um, that would engage uh, the City of Eugene Recreation uh, Department in uh, enhancing physical activity education or physical education, excuse me, uh, in our schools and in 4J in particular, I believe. So um, if they get that funding, there'll be some additional programming for physical education for kids in Eugene. And also the Recreation Department's been a real leader in reducing access to sugary drinks in our pools and uh, replacing a lot of the uh, uh, typical vending machines you might see with uh, more healthful choices. So there are choices. Um, people can still bring all their own foods from home that they'd like, uh, but what's being sold on city property is a lot more healthful than uh, what you might expect to see. So I just wanted to highlight that. I think the city, uh, and then there's all the bike ped work as well that uh, it gets around to the physical activity thing. So. I agree when Jennifer says the city staff has been very open to viewing uh, a lot of this work through a public health lens. I think that's very encouraging and bodes well for anything this council might want to put forward on that um, level. Um, I, the one th concerns I, or amongst the concerns I had in terms of what was presented um, around substance abuse and, and mental health work, um, I serve on the police commission, I serve on the human services commission, and in both those venues we see the real detrimental impact of substance abuse and, and not even, um, uh, you know, obviously not always just al alcohol, but also illegal substances and also the impact of mental health. So I'm really hoping that as we go forward in this process we can find, whether it's at the city level or the county level or bringing the state involved that we can really shore up the interventions and the strategies around uh, substance abuse and, and mental health care. Um, I think there's a crying need out there uh, for that and while it may not be resulting in deaths, um, it's certainly resulting in the destruction of lives. So that's one place I'd like to see stronger. All right, next, Chris. Thank you, great presentation. Um, to cut directly into how the city of Eugene could be involved because I think that really is an important point. And part of the opportunities, but the challenges as well, is we approach, and we've had these conversations before, about the role of the city in dealing with conditions and dealing with behaviors. Um, many of the elements we talk about today uh, are relative to conditions. Um, people are obese. People have diseases related to alcohol use. People um, uh, have uh, access to health care. Um, education, income, health are all conditions. One of the challenges we've had as a city council is deciding what our appropriate role is in changing behavior. And you can't go very far into a discussion around health without beginning to start asking questions about behavior. If I ate the right things, I wouldn't have diabetes. If I stopped smoking, then that number would go down. So it is absolutely essential that you consider behavioral elements if you really want to have a significant impact on health. The city of Eugene, though, is saying what is appropriate as a role as a policymaker in affecting behavior. To what degree can we tell people what they can and cannot do? And each member at this table has a different comfort level with regard to what we can and can't tell people to do. When you're talking about the conditions, I don't think you'll have any problem. I mean, that goes all the way down to the staff level. And operationally, the staff can say, what can we do to help relieve these certain conditions, provide greater access? Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think we could go to the point of zoning to say you can or can't have fast food restaurants. That's, that's a behavioral element. But providing access to healthy food at convenience stores within certain parts of town. Um, that's going to be for us the delicate balance, is where can we find that magic, um, appropriate sweet spot 
in doing very effective things to deal with a lot of the conditions that we can actually have an impact on. And there's a whole list of them here. And I think we, we could jump on those and say, what are those conditional things we can affect? What will be the more interesting conversation for us and where we have to figure out what our comfort level is, is to what degree we can be also engaged with you on affecting behavior. Because you want to have improvement to the health in the community. And you can't really do that until you start talking behavior. Maybe a key to that is to talk about behavioral change, not so much as a push, but as a pull. There may be some things we can do to help pull appropriate behavior um, by creating the right levels of incentives or activities or other kinds of things that would be very comfortable for us, that we could do and our community would not rebel against us. So I would encourage us to figure out what are those conditional stuff we can do Let's work on some behavioral stuff that's appropriate and effective for us to work on. And I think, you know, there's many things I could say to that. One of the things to keep in mind is I don't think there are many people among us who don't want to eat better and that don't want to exercise more. And what we're really doing by creating healthy food environments, so more farmers markets, more community gardens, things that, you know, people want. Um, we're making it easier for people to access those choices. And we're not making anyone go to the farmer's market or participate in community gardening. We're just making those options available for people and really looking at where in our community they are available and um, so that there's access for everyone. Um, so I think, you know, that's when we think about um, healthy food, um, going to Claire's comment, we're really working to provide some healthy options. I remember as a child growing up in Oregon and going to the swimming pool and what you could get was a red vine and a soda and there wasn't something else. So we're not really, um, you know, providing options for people if that's the environment we have. Um, in, in terms of tobacco, um, some of the data that we're getting, so the Surgeon General in 2006 released a report that shows that there is no safe level of exposure to um, tobacco smoke. So even outside. So um, what we know is that um, where um, someone who is smoking outside in a public environment even is affecting the health of others. So really it's, you know, how are we looking at these issues and are we um, really considering, uh, you know, the exposure and how, you know, my behavior is impacting someone else. I mean, there was a time, I mean, when we think about where we've come as well, I mean, there was a time in my lifetime, I don't know exactly what year, when we could smoke in this building. Um, you know, I've um, chatted with um, staff here who, you know, people were smoking at their desks. We could smoke in the supermarket. We could smoke on airplanes. Um, you know, we've really come a long way with that. And um, from what I see, our community is ready for more. We just had the U of O go tobacco free on their entire campus, and that went exceptionally well. Um, and we have reduced exposure there. We're getting a lot of reports of people quitting. I think the data point we had here was 69% of people want to quit. Um, the vast majority. We um, did some work even in um, HAXA housing. We did some survey work of HAXA residents, and among HAXA residents, the vast majority wanted tobacco-free housing. So in February of uh, 2011, um, they went tobacco-free indoors. Um, so there's, there's demand for these things, and I think that we might not realize how much demand that there is from our community. Um, I get calls every day. Um, about um, concerns of exposure to tobacco smoke, mostly in um, apartment complexes. That's the most common um, call I get. And then, um, you know, constant um, comments about um, outdoor uh, tobacco exposure as well. So, great. I think there's so, we are going to have to wrap up because we have to transition between this and the next meeting. But uh, Betty's the last one. Up. We can okay. still. Okay. Um, I think light is important to mental health, and I wonder why we meet in this, keep the drapes closed in this room. That is. <laughs> um, I agree with that. Yeah, I've, it's hurting my mental health. Um, <laughs> I think, I, as several people have said, I, I think we should concentrate on the things that the city can do. We can't do a lot of things to make people be better. The best thing we did was stop smoking in restaurants and bars, which was uh, one of the best community efforts I've ever seen with the, the people who worked on us to get us to do that and for over a period of time. Um, I think they, for food, we can't make people eat something, but, but as has been said, uh, encouraging community gardens, making them accessible, 
and protecting agricultural land, which has to do with not expanding the growth, urban growth boundary into agricultural land. Um, we can do what we can to help the farmers market, any farmers markets. Um, and the water quality and the air quality, we do have some control over, and they're very important aspects of health. Uh, industries that pollute should not be uh, encouraged. We should uh, take, take, an, uh, take a stand when someone's asking to pollute some more. And back to the Amazon headwaters to protect the water quality for us and for people downstream is important. Thank you. The only other thing I would just add for us and for you to think about is I th think when we know that there are populations that are being more affected than other populations in our community, that when we do things like um, summer in the city or other kinds of things, if we can think about how the things we're offering, whether, whether they're culturally appealing and whether they draw or provide something for, for those parts of the community, we can we can better focus what we do as a city to try to um, help raise the uh, health of the of, of those more affected populations in our community. I really think that is something we can do if we if we really look through the lens of what we're already offering and who's not participating and who is and how it would help if we found a, a way to better bring them in. I think that's something we could really make a a difference within our own toolbox. So thank you very, very much. And thank you for the thank opportunity. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Look forward to partnering with you. Thank you. We need to. Did you close the meeting? Nope.